all three of you talked about the importance uh, to the economy of agriculture and agro workers. Um, and yet we have an increasingly urban uh, base, uh, urban government. Winnipeg is the uh, site for provincial government to win. You can't win unless you win Winnipeg. So how much attention is being paid uh, to agricultural issues by the provincial government? We just had a budget federally. How much is being paid federally to uh, agriculture? And is it enough? And, uh, and if it's not enough, why isn't it enough? I'll just start with one example. These gentlemen can give some others. In 2008, the federal government came up with a uh, science and technology um, strategy, and it actually took agriculture out of the equation. In 2015, they've recognized the disservice to um, the industry, but also to the economy. And this is a government that's very much about jobs in the economy. And agriculture and food are now back into the strategy and I think that, that is an example of um, what happens when the communication line gets dropped. So I'll just use that as one example. Andrew, do you want to add to that? Well, just to give you an example of small things. If you don't have money to do an agricultural research, you can't do, for example, work in nutrition. People say, why is work in animal nutrition important? Currently with pigs, we can convert about 3.4 pounds of feed per pound of gain, roughly something like that. Um, wouldn't it be wonderful if we could do 2.5 to one pound of gain? In other words, for two and a half pounds of feed, we can get one pound of meat. Why is this important? Because we take grain that's worth, say, 10 cents a pound, and we convert it into meat that's worth a dollar a pound, but we export it out. The transportation cost per pound is roughly the same. So we want to do value added here. This is, but can we be more efficient? Can we can be competitive with countries that don't have that research age, have difficulties implementing it on the farm and so on? This is where we have to be able to say, and it's a, as Karen pointed out, it's not running twice as fast, you almost have to run three times as fast to try and stay ahead. Because internet has made technology much more widely available. And I'm not sure, at a provincial government level, or even the national government level, there's an understanding of science. There's almost like a, we, we get back in, we have debates whether evolution is a theory. You know? well, the, <laughs> yes, if we're still debating that, then certainly we are in trouble. And did you want to add more to that? Well, I come back to where I, essentially where I started. It's what is the image of agriculture. And it's the negative dimensions, whether it's a storybook, whether it's the complainers, whether it's the uh, polluters. And, uh, and as we have fewer people involved in ag or connected to agriculture, I think that uh, those making the decisions, they will, why invest in that sector? It's a, they're a bunch of losers. And, and I've heard that term. Agriculture is a bunch of losers. And uh, didn't take kindly to it, but uh, the point being that I think we have, we have an image problem that we have to deal with. And, to get on the radar screen of the decision makers. Well, certainly, I think, speaking from the media perspective, there's sort of different ways of doing it. You're right, it's the lone man on the prairie fighting you know, the, 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 the environment, or else it is the, the polluter, the idea that you've done things that are wrong, it's GMO foods, it's we are all in crises. And so this is part of that new trend as well. People are increasingly becoming educated, largely, I think, by what they read on the internet, unfortunately. And so this is promoting some new trends that are very, very interesting. The sort of the, the dynamic against GMOs, the dynamic against uh, pork, the vegetarian diets, the anti-gluten diets. You were talking about that, Karen, from the perspective of how are we evolving. Can you sort of uh, jump into sort of a conversation about what that means then for what we are expecting on our plates when I, when I come home at uh, six o'clock at night and trying to prepare food for myself or my family. I could, I could touch on that in two ways. One is that um, the, the dietary habits of today are different. So whereas I might have grown up and enjoyed homegrown roasted chicken or a steak, uh, and today when I get that, I enjoy that equally. Um, if I'm dealing with a table of people who are used to drinking a lot of their meals, which is the case, and there's nothing wrong with it. And um, 
who are not familiar with seeing that ingredient in its more unprocessed state, the pleasure, that the pleasure factor has changed, right? So, so the dynamics are not as simple as just the, the, these rampant opinions. Food is everybody's business, everybody loves food. That's a great thing, and that's a great opportunity for agriculture. But there are lots of steps that we have to connect between food and agriculture. And, and to me, what, what we have to do is convince every consumer to believe in the value of, of learning for themselves, of not simply following opinion, and because it's such big business, right, there's a lot of money to be made in giving opinions around food. We have to be smart enough not to follow opinions and turn those into trends that ultimately will affect us either in the pocketbook or in terms of our health and, and, and future life, quality of life, and make the, the best decisions we can with the knowledge we've gained, that we've independently sought out. That's critical thinking and that's taking personal ownership and that, that's a part of, I think, what will turn us into a healthy society and it'll help our governments. I agree, our governments are cumbersome. They need our help to be able to make those changes. If we as voters refuse change, the likelihood of a government being willing to totally revamp an institution is very, very low. Go ahead, Ed, go ahead. Ed. Okay. Uh, I think one of the things underlying a lot of this is how do we sort out, when we're talking about science, uh, legitimate science and, dare I use the term, junk science. And we hear a lot of it. I heard a fascinating one on CBC uh, about uh, milk is, uh, don't drink milk, uh, uh, eat vegetables, etc. And, uh, you know, one could spend a lot of time trying to deal with that. But I think that relates to that, I think, a very important dimension, and that's the interface between food and health. And I think, uh, uh, we don't spend enough time understanding just how food impacts health. And sure, we have Canada's food guide, et cetera, et cetera, but I think there's just not that understanding of uh, uh, how food impacts our health. But, but the problem is that, is, is that, uh, that three, three years ago or five years ago or seven years ago, they were telling me to stop eating uh, high uh, fat food and uh, go for saccharin and, and don't, don't eat sugar, but eat artificial sweeteners. Now they're telling me I should be eating bacon, thank God, uh, I should be eating bacon and eggs every morning and do the high fat food and forget the low fat food because I'm, that's not, you know, I'm not getting satisfied. So the health conditions have changed over time as well. And the, the whole idea of the, the uh, Canadian food guide has changed as well. It, it, it's hard as a consumer to figure out what the heck I'm supposed to do. Oh, there's a very simple solution to that, Shannon. If you like it, it's it's good science. If you don't like it, it's based on junk science. <laughs> you sound like a politician now, <laughs> Did you want to add more, Andrew? Well, I mean, this is how, I mean, two things. One, people complain, so farmers are always complaining, wine, wine, wine. Well, actually, they don't. But the problem is, is they put a whole bunch of farmers in a room. It's like putting a whole bunch, all the accountants lived in one suburb of Winnipeg. They'd all be whining too because no one understands them and you know no one listens to their advice and so on. You put all the bankers in one suburb, they'd be all mad about life in general and so on, and no one understands the banking industry and you know government should step in and do something radical. I mean, that's the nature of people talking. I'm sure newspaper reporters, when they all get together to complain about the editors and so on. You know, like it just <laughs> at the end of the day, so what? You know, like and, and the, 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 but the funny thing is on food. This is how, as an industry, we responded to this issue of fat in the diet. So we produced lean pigs, super lean pigs. These are very muscular pigs. The meat is incredibly lean. And now we're getting complaints. When they fry up a pork chop, it doesn't taste like mama used to make. And they want more fat back in the, in the frying pan. Oh, goodness sakes. Like, uh, you know, it took 30 years to get to the lean pig. Now they want us to go back to something else. But on the other hand, we have, we have to do this smartly because we have other markets to do this in. So, like, for example, we are a number one provider of pork in Japan. In fact, to be honest with you, we make more money selling pork in Japan than we do selling the Canadian housewife. So what are we going to do? Um, it's, it's a balanced thing. So what we'll end up doing is we'll supply different products for different markets and so on, different tastes and so on, 
and we'll get more differentiation in the marketplace. And that's coming. There's more and more differentiation of products, trying to satisfy individual needs. And some people will want artificial food, some people want you know, fake food, so on. Some people want to go vegetarian, and so on. Farmers will provide for all those different markets, and we will do the same. So one of the things that I noticed when I was living in, uh, in Quebec City was that I actually got produce that tasted like produce. It wasn't from California. It wasn't like the tomatoes from California are horrible compared to the tomatoes that I got when I was living in Quebec City. The, the little tiny strawberries that I got in Quebec City compared to the strawberries that I get here at Superstore, my God, they're disgusting. So can we talk a little bit about the provincial uh, barriers that prevent actual agricultural products from Quebec coming to Manitoba, that, that prevent us from actually tasting interesting food that's grown here in, in Canada? She doesn't want to answer that. <laughs> no, well the thing is, I don't think we have the regulations so much uh, against interprovincial movement. Part of it is the cost of moving it. And uh, you know, if, you're, if you go into a small market where you can get those lovely strawberries or, or whatever, uh, Safeways or, uh, or uh, Sobeys will want considerably more. And the problem becomes one of how do you deal with vo uh, providing the volume and the cost of uh, the logistics of moving them. And that's, I think that's the volume issue is a very, very big one. In fact, I think uh, ha Andrew may recall that uh, when we were, the hog industry was being grown in Manitoba, the, one of the biggest challenges was to assurance of supply, so that if we wanted to supply hogs into uh, Japan, we had to have a volume going through. Farmers are independent, and they won't necessarily provide it because today's the uh, feature that we want, because uh, tomorrow it might be something different. Or Andrew, did you want to add to that? I think we're going to actually open it up to the floor too because I've hogged the microphone long enough. Um, I'm going to take that microphone from you. I'm going to give this one to her and we will go to the floor to ask questions. Here you go.